as you can see, I've lost the official first Jared challenge. It was a sad moment. All you Instagrammers and all you Facebook people, you know what we're talking about. You saw it posted. But from now on, there are going to be more Jared challengers. Let's see out there who can beat the Jared. Let's see who didn't fall asleep in history class. For every episode at the end, we're going to give a question of my next honoree. You guess it. Not only will I toast them, I will toast you on the show. Bring it. Let's see who knows their history. Now that's good history. Hey, man. Glad you can make it. How's it going? Oh, going rough. Bad day at work. I need a beer. Oh, you had a bad day, huh? Well, I can fix that. So, bad day. Were you bombarded 25 hours straight by cannon fire? No, ain't that cutthroat. Oh. All right. So, in your work truck today, was it almost blown up while you were still in it? Nah, that didn't happen. Well, you might have had a bad day. But you know, I know someone who had a worse day. Hey, you in the back. Come on over here. Grab a bar stool. Grab your favorite beverage. I got a story to tell you. <laughs> about George Armistead's early life, mostly what we know is his military career. Well, we do know he was born on April 10, 1780, on a Virginia plantation in Newmarket, Virginia. Him and his four brothers all served in the War of 1812, either in the Army or the Militia. In his early military career, he served in the Quasi War, which was a small war we had with France, undeclared. Once again, same thing that happened in this war happened in that one. The French are picking on our shipping because we don't have a lot of shipping. We don't have a lot of big ships, so they're picking on our ships and looting them. So he signs up, serves his country. He gets some military experience. War's over. doesn't last very long. We don't need a lot of troops anymore. So he's honorary discharged. War of 1812 breaks out. James Madison declares war on Great Britain. They're messing with our freaking ships again. And Madison's tired of it. I'm tired of you guys messing with our ships. If you want more on that after you watch this video, go check out my James Madison episode and you'll get a little bit more in depth. But he's tired of it. Declares war on them. We're not ready for war. But he can't let us mess with our ships either. So, he's looking for every able-bodied man he can. And Major Armistead is one of his able-bodied men. Of course, we're fine on the Canadian border. There's a fort, Fort Niagara, where this man's stationed. They, the British, actually built another fort, Fort George, on the other side to counteract it. In the end, the American fort is just a little bit, is just a little bit more supplied and has more men than the British fort. And they also have Major Armistead right here the artillery, and they bombard the heck out of that fort. We capture it. He distinguishes himself so well that they give him the battle flags to take to James Madison and present it to him that we won a huge victory. During this time period, Washington gets burnt down because the British have taken over and they start burning the White House. They're going to Baltimore to attack Fort McHenry. This man comes up handing me British flags. You're a good artillery officer. You've already beat the British once. You think he can do it one more time? He gives him command of Fort McHenry. When he arrives at the fort, you would think his first thing he does. Check the cannons. Check the ammunition. Make sure his troops are ready. No. The first thing he does... He commissions a battle flag. He wants to make a U.S. flag that's so big the British can see it easily. 
So, he goes to Mary Pickers Gill, her daughter and seven seamstresses, and commissions a 42-foot by 30-foot flag. It will be the largest flag in the United States at the time. So, Armistead, all he's got left is to sit and wait. He knows they're coming, just when are they going to get here? He has a garrison, his fort has 1,000 men, and he has 20 cannons. The British have 5,000 men and 19 ships. Let me get this straight. 19 ships. We have one more cannon than they have ships. And even their smallest vessel holds at least four cannons. And I'm giving a lot of grace. They're coming. And they're coming in force. And they are going to try and put this fort down to the smallest speck of rubble. On September 13th, 1814. It's a Sunday afternoon. The first can shot fired. Here we go. It's going to be a long day for you, Major. So the bombardment begins. And like I said, this is the best Navy in the world. They have one of their best Navy commanders in the world. They want to lower this fort to the ground. They have cans from 18 pounders to 36 pounds. So a 36 pound cannonball flying to the air with Thor striking the fort. This is the most destructive force made by man in the world. As Napoleon said, only lightning bolts can be compared to cannon. So ma imagine getting hit with 1,800 rounds. That's how many they fired, 1,800 rounds. 1,800 lightning bolts hitting the same spot for 25 hours. That what was going on. They wanted to destroy this fort and leave nothing left. Now, during the environment, finally they strike something. They hit a cannon. They kill four men that were taking care of a battery. But after that, they're really not hitting anybody. They're not hitting any guns. They're really missing all over the place, even though it's an awesome bombardment. And being a good artillery officer, Armistead knows they are out of range of him. Him firing back would just clearly miss and waste ammunition. One flies into where you don't want it to fly in. It hits the magazine where all the ammunition is. For some reason, the cannonball does not ignite. Armistead, in a panic, gets everybody over there and ships every piece of ammunition out of there. We're not going to give him a second chance of that. And puts it lower so it will not get hit again. So, they're bombarding, bombarding. And now the British think, we've really torn into these guys for hours now. They haven't fired back. We've pretty much, I think, got these guys. So they start to move closer so their artillery will be more effective. And Armistead just waits. Just waits. And when he knows he can hit them, he unloads his guns on them. We're still alive in here, guys. So the British back up to where they were. Right? Uh oh these guys still got some fight left in them. As darkness falls on the fort, the British have been going at this for a while. They feel we got to do something else. It doesn't seem to be taking the effect that we think it should. So they attempt a sneak attack. While they're bombarding, they are going to land a small force of 1,500 troops to attack the fort from the rear while they're bombarding them. So they get these small boats and they ship them in by night so that they can get ashore. Once they're ashore, of course the British don't want to hit their own troops. They set up a flare to let you know, hey, we landed, you know, so you're not going to shoot us. What they don't know is there are two other forts sitting there next near Fort McHenry. There's Fort Babcock, which is not really a fort at all. It's basically a bunch of earthworks that they just threw up. But there's some soldiers there and six cannons. And they see this flare go up and they find it's kind of odd because they're like, it's not from the fort. It's got to be from the British. So they unload on this position with their six guns. There's Fort Covington right next to it, which is a fort that we're building, but it's not completely finished yet. But they see them firing on this spot, and they know Babcock's on their side, so they start unloading on that spot. And then Fort McHenry sees them two firing, like, 
I don't know what's over there, but something's over there. Our guys are hitting it. It's in our range. So Armistead turns his guns and starts unloading on this position. And this crossfire decimates that British landing force where they have to get out of Dodge. They're not going to, there's no sneak attack anymore. Three sides know they're there and they pull out and head back to the ships. During this crossfire is where most of the casualties of the British force was taken in this sneak attack. Now, after 25 hours of bombardment, finally the cannons were silent. And the Americans are sitting in the fort like, okay, what's next? What's going on is Admiral Cochrane. The man in charge of the British Navy, he has a decision to make. Do we continue fighting or do we withdraw? The men over at North Point have not made any headway. They're waiting for that fort to fall before they can really make their advance. The sneak attack doesn't work. He realizes after several attempts that we he is not putting the damage on the fort that he thought he would have. So he decides that... I think it's best to withdraw. I don't know if we can do any more damage than what we've already done. So, one by one, each ship starts to go off in the distance. He withdraws the ships, and the Americans start to see each ship start going away, going away. 25-hour bombardment against the best Navy in the world. We lose four men. Because of one cannibal, we lose four men and we have 24 wounded. We took out 330 killed, wounded, or captured their men. I say mostly during the sneak attack. So as the ships are about to leave, Armistead takes down his 17 by 20 flag. And the flag I told you about earlier, this 30 by 42, he raises the flag. I want a flag that they can't miss. Oh, and they're going to see it on their way home. I bet you that flag was so big, King George could see it over there in England. Biggest flag in the United States at the time. And there is a party going on in Fort McHenry. They are losing their minds. And this is where you see Francis Scott Key. On a ship out there in the harbor, captured by the British. They're holding him just till the battle is over. He sees the bombardment start. He sees nightfall. Baltimore actually even shuts the lights off so that they can't see to hit anything. So all he can do is see the bombs bursting, the cannon fire. All That's all he can see. The light comes up the next morning. He sees the fort sitting there dormant. The only thing he knows is, well, we must still have it. Our flag's up there. But then when the one flag comes down, in his mind, he's clear over there. The British could have taken it. They could be putting up the British flag next. But he sees this giant ass 30 by 42 flag of the United States. And he hears the troops going off their gourds. Like, we won. We won. We actually won. So, you know what? I know you guys like all Francis Scott Key stuff. But don't forget the man he was writing about. Francis Scott Key sees all this happening. He writes it all down. He publishes it. The defense at Fort McHenry calls it. Now later they start to put these words that he wrote. And they put it to a British drinking song. As a kind of a battle cry. As a fun thing to drink and have fun with. Now in 1916 Woodrow Wilson makes an executive order. Making it kind of a. Uh, kind of a fun, let's have this part of our country. It's kind of a minor anthem. Well, as we know, all that's going on today, executive orders can be overturned. And Congress passed an act in 1931 to rename our national anthem, anthem after the flag, and they call it the Star Spangled Banner. So now every time you guys hear it, don't forget Fort McHenry. And I don't want you to forget that flag still exists. 
And you know what? It was the one time that we could say, you know what? Even this day, we came together as a nation. I heard that some of your family members cut up this flag and actually gave it to parts of the family and distributed it to family, friends, and whatnots. I hope you haunted them. That is an American institution. I'm glad the Smithsonian finally got a hold of it. What's the matter with your family, man? And one of them took one of the stars. We still have a star missing. What state was it, George? Was it Virginia? It better have been Virginia. After the battle, he'll be promoted to lieutenant colonel. He will be given command of Fort McHenry for the remainder of his days. But the battle so strained his nerves and his heart that three years later he would die from it. On April 25th, 1818, he will give his last breath, still as commander of Fort McHenry. He is still buried today in Baltimore at the old St. Paul Cemetery. There's actually a statue of him overlooking Baltimore, the city he defended. A toast to Lieutenant Colonel George Armistead, an American icon that most people don't remember, and that needs to stop today. To the hero of Fort McHenry, Francis Scott Key wrote about it, witnessed it. This man was in the trenches. He lived it. This man not only served his country, he gave his heart for it. And every time you hear that music play and you put your hands over your heart, I want you to remember this man gave his for his country. Happy birthday, Colonel Armistead. Now that's good history. To Matt Miller, you beat the Jared Challenge. So, a toast to Matt Miller. That man knows his history. So, for my next episode, you guys have a chance to be toasted just like Matt was. Not only will I toast my next honoree, I will toast you on the show if you get my question. This president doubled the size of the country in one day. And he paid a mere $15 million to do it. And he called it the Louisiana Purchase. Name me the president. And I will be toasting you as well. So, let's see who knows their history. <laughs>